Hey everyone, Matt from SoundRolling.com here with another sound chat with Eric Milano, who's a, a documentary, mainly a documentary, re-recording mixer, sound designer, um, as well as dabbling in Foley, ADR. I mean, he's just, yeah, a post extraordinaire, which is fantastic. <laughs> um, so hi, Eric. How's it going? Hello. How you doing, Matt? I'm good. I'm good. Um, just, again, a little kind of housekeeping, I guess, before we kind of start. Again, comments are somewhere around this video. Um, again, you can subscribe if you like more of these chats. There's definitely a lot more in the pipeline. Um, and ask your questions, comments, just say hi, anything you like. It's all good. Um, but for now, we'll just get started. And so the the best place to start is, I guess, the beginning, Eric. So how did it all begin? Oh, God. Well, <laughs> let's go way back. Um, I mean, really, probably like a lot of people in this business, um, I, I came through music. And originally, really, from performing music, because I'm a singer and a guitar player, a drummer. And so I had a band. And, and because I had a band, I wanted to learn to record it. I also was very into computers. and so. Um, that was really how I got my start was um, through music and I originally was working at a music recording studio as like an assistant at a place called Green Street Recording which is a, it's now closed you know couldn't quite keep up with the Pro Tools uh, scene so um, they've closed but uh, probably like eight years ago now but they were a pretty big name studio and um, I was there for a little while and you know, it wasn't. Um, it was an amazing experience, but they really weren't that into helping their interns <laughs> or their assistants, which is, I think, a frustrating thing that probably a lot of people have experienced. Um, so after about a year of, of of working there, I was just like, well, it's not really working out. Oh well, <laughs> and I kind of went into another field actually, and. Um, Still, of course, playing music on the side, but um, I just um, worked at an internet company, actually, in a completely unrelated uh, aspect of of, of um, empl employment. And um, after doing that for a couple of years, I was put in a unique situation where the company was moving to Seattle, and I was getting a severance, and I was getting unemployment money. So I was able to support myself, and I didn't have a job, and I was like, oh. Wow, what do I do now? And um, I was still very much into Pro Tools and recording music and recording my band, and I was just always on the DUC, the duck. Um, and I found uh, a posting there for an employment section, and somebody was looking for an intern to help him, uh, I guess, um, I'm not sure the word it would be, but file away all the sounds in his sound library, post production. Um, this guy, Tom Paul. Um, who's a re-recording mixer to this day. And I was at the time, I, was, I think I was about 28, 29, and I was like, am I too old to be an intern again? I'm not sure. But I really, you know, loved Pro Tools, and I was, I was in this unique situation, and my girlfriend at the time said, just do it, just do it. And so I did it, and within two weeks, he said, you know, I want to hire you. And so it was a, it was a beautiful situation. Wow. Um, and Tom Paul is quite a character, and he's an amazing guy, an amazing mixer. And he had, at the time, he had a, a studio up in the woods in upstate New York called The Cottage. And so I, I arrived there, and he basically was like, at, at, for, for the first maybe month or two, he basically was like Mr. Miyagi in The Karate Kid, where, <laughs> where he would, um, he would sit, you know, he would sort of have me fix things around the house, and I'd be like, oh, okay. When, when are we going to do some sound work? <laughs> sound work? But he would kind of have me, I built a mailbox for him. I, I um, rewired some, some, some lights in his driveway. I, you know, I, I replaced a lock in his Subaru. All these weird, weird tasks. And, <laughs> and it really was just like the Karate Kid. And eventually he would start giving me little sound tasks. And he was sort of testing my, I guess, I mean, Probably, first of all, he just wanted stuff fixed at his house. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. but um, it, he was sort of testing my metal, I think, and he was um, was giving me little tasks here and there. And then it just sort of built up more and more. And he had me 
outfit, he bought a little Airstream tra a trailer, which is, um, if, for those of you not familiar, like basically a, a mobile home uh, from this, that were originally made in the 70s, so these beautiful metal-enclosed um, bullet-shaped trailers. And he was getting so much business at the time that we outfitted a trailer with little Pro Tool stations and um, began doing some editing from there. And, and that was, that's basically how it started, you know, yeah. Fantastic, fantastic. And was the always, was the aim, because uh, now I know that you're broadly in kind of documentaries and, and shorts and things like that, was there always yeah. an aim to kind of take it beyond music? Um, no, I really never had the thought that to go into post-production. Um, it really was completely foreign to me. Music was really my love, but once I got into it, I realized how cool it was, and I did start to really love it. Um, but it was not something, and that's probably partly why I was vacillating a little bit. I was like, movies? Uh, you know, I don't know. It's not, it, it, didn't, it didn't have such the draw for me that music did. But really, once I got into it, I really did fall in love with it, and to this day, still am. Um, yeah. yeah, still be a rock star of the sound. <laughs> right, awesome. Exactly. That was, that was <laughs> the dream. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean, one of the uh, one of your kind of credits that sticks out to me is Gasland, and you've mm -hmm. done actually. I didn't even realize there was a Gasland two that came out, so I'll have yes, to. pretty recently, yeah. Yeah, I'll definitely have to check that out as well, which is awesome. Um, but let's just get more into sound design and re-recording for documentaries, because on mm -hmm. the one hand, everyone's thinking documentaries. Okay, you probably. Yeah, you're cleaning up dialogue, things like that, but maybe you're leaving everything else untouched. I mean, how, how deep are you going into documentaries? Yeah, I mean, really, I would say, of course, it's not as ubiquitous that you go as deeply into sound design and things like that in a documentary, but really, we, we're always open to going into, going as far as possible. Um, and... That includes Foley. You know, some people are, 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 can be surprised that we do a lot of Foley on documentaries. But really, the whole point of sound design is just to bring it to life. And oftentimes on a documentary especially, there's a lot of times when um, the filmmaker is really just a first-time filmmaker, as Josh Fox on, on Gasland was. Um, and so they may not... And also, they're in crazy situations where they're not really, they don't have a boom operator, you know? Um, and so a lot of stuff is not getting picked up or not getting picked up well, and we're really trying to convey something to the audience, and so whatever techniques we can use to, to build things up, bring them to life, bring them to larger than life, to get across the point that the filmmaker is trying to make, we're, we're all, for, all, all for it. Yeah. Cool. And, and this, uh, and yeah. it's obviously, again, Doing doing shorts and documentaries, you seem to have mainly gone into the documentary field. Is that just because of the people you kind of know and they just keep doing stuff or they keep recommending you for documentaries? It's just always interesting when people fit into certain niches like game audio or right. documentaries or... Yeah. I mean, I definitely do still work on a lot of narrative stuff. I have done a lot of documentaries, but also a lot of narrative stuff. And I think it does... It does you do sort of fall into a niche, and um, because I worked with Tom Paul, who works on a lot of, as, as, as the way I began, um, he does a lot of documentaries. Um, one of the first big ones we did was Born Into Brothels, which won an Oscar, and sort of once that happened, you know, our little team became um, this sort of documentary go-to in the, in the New York indie film scene. Um, so, yeah, you... It, it, but I actually, I have to say that documentaries are really my favorite. I love documentaries. Um, maybe that has something to do with it because I bring a little passion to it. I just love reality. So I just, there's nothing, there's nothing, there's no better story than a real story, you know. But of course I love narratives too. I can't, you know. But documentaries I do love. I suppose it's just the ideal of like having a narrative that's actually true and actually kind of like... This someone could have written this, but this is actually right. happening, and we're we're yeah. making making that up. Yeah. Um, and and your team, can you just talk about about the team, a team you have now? Um, you mean like the players in it and the team? Yeah, yeah. Um, it it's it varies quite a lot these days. It started out that it was just really me and Tom, which was 
an incredible education for me because he basically, Tom basically threw me into trial by fire. You know, again, the Mr. Miyagi um, uh, analogy. <laughs> he basically was like, yeah, just do this. And the amazing thing about Tom Paul is that he sort of, he sort of like puts all his trust in you regardless of whether you actually <laughs> have the skills, the knowledge, anything. But if he sort of gets a glimmer in his eye about you and he'll just sort of trust you and I've seen him do it with other people and sometimes and sometimes the people don't aren't actually able to do it but I was able to somehow make it work and but the, the amazing thing about it is that I've really done every aspect of post production I've been the Foley artist I've been the Foley recordist I've been the ADR recordist actor you know um, dialogue editor I got you know very deeply into dialogue editing for many years um, and then finally re-recording Mixer. And when you've seen all the roles, and really in a, in a deep way, you become intimately, intimately familiar with what's going to work, what you need. Um, and so that, that education was really critical for me. Um, yeah, but, but regarding the team, it's really... I often work at Gigantic Post, which is a beautiful studio that Tom and I helped build in uh, Chelsea of New York City um, and there's, there's various editors that we that we work with yeah I suppose it just it just fits whatever whatever size project there is as well but exactly. it's always nice to, to know of, of core dynamics and especially of you and Tom and how did right. that I mean you've had a lot of chances to obviously try various different areas was it a case of okay well we have a new project in can I do dialogue this time or can I do Foley this time or was it more right. like I'm going to do this, and so you're going to do everything right. else. Right. It was pretty much that. It was pretty much Tom enjoyed doing effects and he and mixing, and he would leave the dialogue to me depending on his time. Um, I would always be the Foley artist. I love doing Foley. Um, probably maybe because of my musical background as a drummer, it, it really works well with Foley performing. Um, but it would be... Um, that's how it would be doled out. But as the years have gone on, um, we have we brought on more editors, and even now at this time, he and I actually don't even work together as much as we used to because now I'm sort of doing my own projects and and hiring my own editors, and yeah, that's where it's at these days. Yeah, it just naturally grows. That's fantastic. Yeah, exactly. The um, so going back to I guess dialogue editing, just because again with the with the kind of documentary background, you right. there's a perception that you can obviously get away with uh, kind of more in a sense, mm -hmm. um, but, but how much are you, I'm trying to think of an example, but it's, but in terms of, if I combine it with the kind of ADR aspect, where, where are you drawing the line between uh, kind of keeping that original kind of performance, I guess, even though the mm -hmm. story is real and the scenes are real, and then a time where you choose to uh, maybe replace a line, two lines, and so on. Yeah, um, we definitely have done ADR. We do ADR all the time in documentaries, nowhere near as much on an, as you would on a narrative feature, but also to help the director tell the story. Sometimes, you know, it's hard to have your camera and be able to point it everywhere at the right time. Um, so sometimes it's not that, you know, it's just that you need to help tell the story. Um, and it does very much depend on the director. There are certain directors that are sort of purists and they feel a little guilty doing that and they feel like maybe they're sort of cheating a little bit. In fact, um, Zana Brisky, who was the director of Born at the Brothels, felt very strongly that there should be nothing added artificially by the sound team, but it was co it was a co-directing team on that film. So Zana Brisky and Ross Kaufman was the other director and he felt the opposite. So <laughs> there, it was quite it was quite a push and pull. And I remember doing some foley for like someone walking down the stairs in one of the brothel brothels and Ross, you know, wanting us to to do that and, and Zana saying, no, we can you know, what are you doing? We don't take that out, but that should not be there. Um, so, yeah, it must be interesting when there's two completely extreme uh, yeah. di directing um, yeah. kind of styles, I guess. But in, 
I imagine as well that a documentary is is I mean the story the story is generally type of there, but still you're probably doing a lot in the edit. You probably start, for instance, with Gasland with the you again or just start with your premise of uh, X, X and Y is happening because of Z. Let's right. go find out, let's talk to some people. Yeah. Um, how much in the kind of editing process are you all kind of in, including with the picture editor, I guess, uh, having yeah. having an influence on on the kind of meaning of the story with the director? Yeah, I mean, I would say in documentaries, sort of as you might, the general public has sort of become um, maybe immune to this in a way, but when you watch reality TV, you, you often hear the people talking, and it's so obviously edited. The, you know, when they say a line, it's like, hello, oh, da, 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 you know, they're, they're editing together nine million things. Um, so one thing that I can bring to a documentary is, you know, I'm a very good dialogue editor. So the, the picture editor isn't going to have those talents necessarily. Um, and so they'll often have it very roughly chopped. And it just sounds sort of awful. And often I can bring a level of clarity to whatever they're trying to say by just, by just giving it a good dialogue edit. So that's, that's one way um, that we can help in terms of the dialogue edit. Um, what else? What was the original question exactly? <laughs> <laughs> it, was, it was just more to figure out, like, um, just the documentary story, it's obviously constantly evolving. And right. even at a post-production stage, it must still be in, in flux to certain degrees. Yeah. And so are you, well, let me put it this way instead. Uh, things like uh, temp mixes, things right. like um, various cuts of different scenes, are there... I mean, that, again, must depend on if they only have one camera. You've only got kind of one way that it's going to go in a way. Right. Um, but I was just wondering just how that kind of that story development plays in with the even at the sound editing process at kind of the right. very end in terms of that off-camera line. If, if we add that in, that can add X, Definitely. Y, and Z to kind of the rest of the story. Is right. that... How's I mean, I would say that it, it happens a lot also with effects. Like, um, if you're in, a, um, you know, like a, one movie I worked on recently was The Square, which was um, um, demonstrations in Egypt. And, you know, sometimes the camera's really not picking up what, what the visuals are showing us, like a, a, an entire square filled with people and rioting and the camera's not really picking that up, and so we can, we can add the sounds of people riding or the, the, just the chaos or gun shooting. Um, um, sometimes you have, you have um, an explosion that's going on, or like in Gasland when like the, the faucet erupts with a little bit of flame, you, know, you could actually add a little, you know, to it just to, just to bring it out, just to, you know, and, and you want to make it sound realistic. You're not, it's not Lord of the Rings, you know, and, and that's very key to me is making anything I do sound exactly as if you want it to sound as if it's coming through that camera mic, whatever, whatever, whatever everything else is sounding like, you want to make it sound as if it's coming from the same place. Um, so if there's a crowd of people, I'm not going to put it in like, you know, 5-1 surrounds, oh, you know, <laughs> with <laughs> people here, you know. I mean, sometimes you do a little bit of that, but you, ha but you have to be very mindful that you want it to feel realistic, um, at least I do. Um, I wanted. I don't want anyone to be brought up, brought out of the movie. You know, brought out of the story. They want, I want it to feel like it's all happening from camera, um, from the camera's perspective. Yeah. And so, uh, even I guess we're always probably going to come back with the documentary and then the sound design aspects of kind of the yeah. ethics of like yeah. in 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 Gasland, for instance, because it's it makes it kind of more dramatic. It's kind of I guess the artistic license on. On uh, what these people are, are kind of feeling, how do you just exactly. generally f feel about feel about that? I I feel about it fine with it because and I, and specifically Gasland, I can't even remember. I believe actually Josh was was more of the purest bent, and I'm so I was using that as an example, but I can't honestly remember if I actually put any fire yeah. effects anywhere, but. Um, but as to how I feel about that, I feel it's actually completely okay. There's nothing wrong with it because 
from some perspective, that is what's being heard. You know, like um, if the camera was able to actually have a a boom mic on it, that's what you'd hear. Or you know, or if if you had you know a wonderful like um, array of mics in in the square picking up all the chaos, that's what you would hear. So on some level, it's happening. It's just that we're not hearing it, and so. It's it's my job to sort of bring reality to life, and so I really personally don't have a problem with it, especially because documentary itself is really the act of of, of taking a video of something in itself is really already becoming artistic license because um, if I'm over here filming these people rioting, I'm not and I'm not filming. The, gov- the guy in the government office who has a different, completely different, different perspective on the whole thing, and could be right in some way. I'm already using artistic license. I'm, al- I'm already saying, look over here, look over here. This is actually what's right, or this is what's going on. Even this is just what's happening. But it's it's never just that. So that's my that's my take on it. No, it's yeah. It's again, it's just a, a fantastically broad issue, but it's it's yeah. just really interesting when it it relates to. Especially sound effects, because I think, again, it's it, maybe it's again just the, the kind of reality aspect, or just like the constant TV aspect. People are more and more uh, kind of blurring the lines between kind of the the movies and the the quote unquote reality, because it's I mean it's obviously scripted right. <laughs> and things like that, and it's it's becoming. I mean that's just insane. I can't wait to try and get some. Uh, reality guys on because I just don't know how you even just comprehend that. But right. but yeah, and then and then documentary is kind of being one of the uh, let, let's say like again purist kind of uh, narratives in a way. Yeah. Um, but in terms of kind of what your what kind of plugins you're using in terms and kind of uh, yeah, let's start with again dialogue. Uh, just what are you generally What's your general kind of process? You have you have your track, and it's a bit bit rough around the edges. What's mm-hmm. your first kind of couple of steps? Now we're talking about mixing, or in, in terms of it, you've got it in the you've got it in the edit. Okay. So are you you instantly going straight to alts? Are you just trying to level everything all to the same level first, and then do all your processing? Do you have a rough I'd, kind of standard cut out process? Just for a minute there. Oh, sorry. It was just whether you have a rough. Um, kind of standard process that you're always doing um, yeah. for each scene. Right. So I mean, the way I was trained by by Tom basically was, you don't mess with noise reduction during the edit. You just don't, except for of course toning out things. But in terms of removing it, you don't touch that. You leave that to the mixer. And I think that's a very wise way to go about it because on whatever system you're editing on, you can't fully hear what you're doing to the sound, and noise reduction is dangerous, you know. You can you can go way too far with it, especially if you haven't had a lot of experience with it, and also, the, just the way it tends to happen is you sort of get sort of in a zone, and you are sort of got blinders on, and you're like, okay, I removed the noise, but now it sounds like crap, you know, <laughs> and, and, and I think even the best of us sort of don't realize that, and then you come back to it the next day, and you're like, oh, what I do to that, you know? Yeah. So, I think for that reason, it's it's best to leave that to the mixer when he's on the mix stage and he's he's got you know the proper monitoring. Um, but that said, I definitely um, so my editing setup is pretty minimal, unless I'm the one mixing it, and in which case then I could use my mixing mixing um, setup. But when I'm the one editing it, I basically use the reverse plugin, which is a dialogue editor's best friend. Um, I use uh, what else would I use? Occasionally the invert plugin to make sure everything's um, in phase, and the EQ one audio suite plugin I use to um, take out bumps, you know, bass bass bumps on, on the mic. Ooh, and any kind of um, Q10 or anything else like that, like little notches here. Yeah. I would use Q10 if there's like an obvious tone that I can remove without causing too much damage. I would definitely use a Q10, and also I, I love the um, the isotope, and I'll use the decrackle and the declip. Oh, the declip on a on a um, documentary. Now that's 
I, I can't tell you how many times that has done amazing things. The D-clip, and on a documentary, when, when you have a, a guy who's probably not done a lot of sound recording, half the time the thing is distorted to bollocks. I don't know how you say it in England, but... <laughs> <laughs> Pretty much like that, yeah. <laughs> okay. So, um, and the, I, I've, I've been amazed with what, what that plugin can do can, to restore. Sometimes it literally goes to sounding as if you know, there was never anything wrong with it. I'm, I'm often quite amazed by that plugin. Uh, I, I love the RX. I've got the RX3 as well, and I'm definitely mm -hmm. guilty of always, once I get into noise reduction, it's, right. yeah, it's again yeah. Getting, getting that blindness, and it's, yeah, yeah, slap on the wrist and everything. Yeah, else. exactly. <laughs> and, you're, and you're using the reverse plugin, is, is this to create room tone? Yes. Is this what you're doing? Yeah, and it, it must yes. be really tricky in a documentary where there's, for instance, a riot or something, or let's say a quiet quite yeah. interview that's not recorded by, um, I guess, what you could say is a professional sound person because I guess they're focusing on both the story, the shot, the lighting, keeping the person happy, keeping on schedule. They're probably the one-man band. Right. Um, so how are you, I mean, are you finding it, how are you finding room tone, basically, is yeah. what I'm, I'm asking. <laughs> I mean, dial uh a documentary, I would say the dialogue edit of the documentary is probably the most important aspect of of the because it's really that's that's really the heart of what you're you're playing with sound. Of course you're gonna film little things here and there, but the dialogue edit is crucial to a documentary and um, room tone, of course, you're you're on sets often. I mean of course it depends on the documentary. I recently worked on a film called Dinosaur Thirteen, whereas basically the entire documentary was in controlled rooms doing interviews with talking head type things um, or shots and so in, in that case it's, it's not that big a deal um, mm -hmm. but on a documentary the type that we're normally used to where you're, you're sort of out in the field in a completely uncontrolled environment the, no the, the background noise can be you know atrocious and, and switch and it, it can go from atrocious to, to quiet in, in a second but that's not necessarily lining up with how the picture editor is cutting it. So, mm. um, so the dialogue edit is crucial for that reason, just to make it feel like a professional piece of work. Otherwise, it just sounds amateurish with the way the picture editor um, lines it up, and things are just cutting out drastically. Mm. And so a little you, bit. Sorry, go on. I was just going to say, you can, so you can make something feel like it's, it's, it's done in a single take. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, the continuity again must be yeah. It's it's absolutely paramount for keeping people in the story. Right. Um, a lot a lot of people are, are just commenting on the the same uh, noise reduction problems, which is always yeah. good to see. I'm glad it's not just me. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. With noise reduction, I have like uh, when I'm working at Gigantic, they have a cedar, they have a cedar box, um, which I don't know if you're familiar with, but it's like a hardware. I mean, they also have a plug-in now, but it's a hardware at Gigantic. They have the hardware version of the DNS. I don't know what the exact name of it is, but that one's pretty amazing. And then I use the the WNS, which is the Waves one, and I have the I have a special technique where I use the C4 as a mm, noise yeah. reducer, which is really cool. And then I have the RX and a couple of, a couple others. So I have this huge palette, and so you you try them all out, and sometimes just nothing works. Sometimes there's certain types of sound that's really just you can sort of do it, but I prefer almost like, you know what, it's just a little noise, you know, it's okay, especially in the documentary. It's, yeah. Um, and so I've learned over the years to sort of sometimes just be like, you know what, it's, it's okay. It's okay to have noise. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> just yeah. rocking, rocking in your chair. It's okay. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, um, with uh, just kind of uh, finishing off on the, the noise reduction points, you're, I mean, Again, I I learned pretty quickly that um, one big pass is obviously really bad compared to lots of little passes. Is there kind of um, an average that you're doing? Is it like do you just try? Okay, I'll do three passes at a light level and just see where that is. What do you mean by passes? You mean um, in terms of like just applying the noise reduction process. Are you uh -huh. applying the same plugin? Um, like the D clipper, for instance, three times in a smaller succession than you are doing uh, it once at a big 
I usually, with something like the D Clipper, I'll usually do it, I'll just, te you know, test it out in um, loop mode and just until it works. And then if it doesn't work, you know, usually, I, I, you know, I definitely have tried doing it multiple times. That doesn't work with that particular plug-in. Um, I love doing that with compression, to have uh, two or more compressors in a, in a chain. Mm. Um, and with noise reduction, definitely also do that. Um, because diff different noise reducers definitely do work in different ways and, and work for different things. You know, sometimes things like the WNS or the Cedar are very good for shirt noise, like when the mic is on the shirt or there's just, and it's got a high sort of thing, mm. high, high frequency type thing. Sometimes they're good for that, but other ones are better for, you know, rumbles or um, more, more mid-range noise. So yeah, definitely use, with noise reduction, I definitely have a, a whole palette that I'm sometimes using four different plugins at once on. So. Yeah. Well, you, you must need, again, it's just, I guess, the trial and error because it's the ever-changing environment, which must be exactly. kind of challenging and fun. Um, yeah. Just in terms of, uh, are you Mac or PC? Mac. Oh, I, 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 my first Apple II Plus was when I was, I think, five, five or six years old. So I've been deeply, deeply embedded into the cult since since a young boy. So. Brilliant. No, that's always yeah. good to hear. It's good to hear. <laughs> so. Yeah. All right. What about yourself? Your your Mac yeah. PC. Yeah, okay. Mac as well. We can, yeah. we can continue the conversation. Yeah. Right? Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> we've got the same. We've got the same headphones and everything. It's, <laughs> I've got my got my tattoo. And, no. Oh wait. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and just getting back to kind of again, kind of the epic because you're doing documentary because it's a narrative. Have you ever uh, sort of strongly disapproved of anything that the documentary maker has done, uh, in, or just in terms of the story itself, or how they've kind of uh, are choosing to portray something? Because you may have seen, obviously, uh, let's say a whole a whole interview section, and eventually you've cut it down, so you're kind of uh, again just creating. Oh. Am I still there? Yeah. Sorry. You're still creating yeah. a narrative. Yeah. And I mean, I because I've done a lot of dialogue editing on those types of things, I'm often privy to the handles, you know, mm. especially because I'm always looking for room tone. Um, and just as an aside, I really never use you, the room tone that the the sound recorder provides. I'm always, I always like to use, especially in a documentary, because the room is so changing all the time that I like to use whatever's closer to that bit of the interview. But um, so because I'm opening the handles a lot, I really hear the rest of the interview, the part that didn't make it in. Mm -hmm. And there's definitely, it definitely happens all the time that you're hearing stuff like, oh, well, that changes that a little bit. You know, that's that's not quite what they were saying. Um, so again, it's 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 very much artistic choice that, that the director and the editor are, are, are making. It's not so much the sound sound guy because at that point we're really working with a locked picture but um, I definitely have seen many times uh, things that might be considered, you know. It's it's the director's telling his story, or his or her story. Yeah. For sure. Yeah. No, again, it's it's just another, it's, it's kind of the endless can of worms that will probably keep popping up exactly. uh, <laughs> throughout the thing. Um, so Foley, Foley mm -hmm. as well. You you love Foley. Um, yes. Have you got your own little? You must have your own little Foley pit and things like that. Uh, yeah, well, at Gigantic, they, we have a a room that with four, no, five different pits. Fantastic. And yeah. just in terms of that kind of setup for a, a, a Foley session that you're doing, are you are you you doing it scene by scene? Are you doing kind of uh, the whole film and just doing? The foot, or are you just lining it? How are you lining up the footage to cover it most effectively? Um, basically, we're um, that's most often handled by whoever's cueing the foley, and that so many different people have different styles. Um, but um, and it also depends what studio you're working in because some studios might have three different wood floors, whereas the one I'm working in might only have one. In which mm -hmm. case, it doesn't really help to say you know hardwood floor and less hardwood floor. <laughs> it's like, okay, we have this one, so we're, we're going to be basically doing this one. Um, you know, same thing with, it, it, it's actually more applicable to cement, you know, like some people write sidewalk, asphalt, parking lot, 
Um, yeah. And so that actually becomes something that can slow you down. Um, depending, of course, you want you want to match the surface as best you can, and sometimes you need more grit. You know, like if it's outside, you want it to sound very gritty, but if you're inside in a basement, maybe a little less gritty. So you always want to be paying attention to that. But basically the best way to set it up is to, you know, take, changing your shoes takes a lot of time. You know, you don't want to be um, switching characters constantly. So you want to do all the sing, a single character on a single surface if you're doing footsteps at a time. Um, the same thing uh, with, you know, you want to do all the hand movements at the same time. And then oftentimes you have to set up sort of crazy contraptions in Foley to get a certain sound. Um, and so those need to be sort of pieced together because sometimes, you know, you, it takes you a half hour just to build a thing and, and then um, you want to get all those done and then make sure you got them all because if you break it down, you don't want to have to build it up again. Yeah, can you think of a, a, a specific sound that you were kind of after where you had to build a kind of complex machine? Because I, always people are kind of uh, coming to me in terms of, they say Foley, and then they say sound effects, and then they always kind of go, what's the difference? And there is kind of an overlap, but generally it's kind of whatever's on the body. But if you're well, building con contraptions, it's probably going into kind of both worlds. So do you have an example? Yeah. I mean, I would say Foley is anything that you're recording live to picture. But, of course, that can really be called a sound effect too. But that's basically what Foley is, is when you're recording something live live to picture that you wouldn't find in a, in a library because it's too specific. It's too, um, you know. Just because of the speed or the, yeah. just the effort that was in it. Exactly. If you just sort of cut footsteps of someone going clomp, 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 but someone's sort of like stuttering a little bit or like slowing down and walking more gingerly because, and then going uh, more intensely, you know, there's a lot of subtlety to, to footsteps. And it just doesn't, you just can't cut that right. You need, you'd need, I mean, I'm sure you could these days when you have, you know, the, um, the, the drummers, um, forget, I guess it's by F Expansion, this, this drum thing that has like, you know, 96 levels of, on the, each drum that they sample. Ta, 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 ta. You know, you could probably do this with Foley too and, um, and play it all with the keyboard, but it's, it's, at some point you'd just be like, just, just walk it. <laughs> so, um, Exactly. So um, there's a lot of subtlety in Foley. So, but to think of something that um, that I made, I mean, it's it's often, you know, you're working on something like you need to get the sound of maybe they're on a boat and it's it's a certain like metal that they're walking on, or maybe someone just like slaps their hand on like you know a huge metal post. Yeah. And it's not something that you're going to have in a, in a Foley studio necessarily. And so you often have to, like, you know, wrap it in blankets and, you know, um, r remove all resonances. And do, I'm, I'm sure there's more interesting examples that, that, that I've done, but you basically have to make it sound real. And you don't have the entire world in your Foley room, so you have to improvise. And you have to do it quickly because there's often a lot of cues to get through. So... How many how many cues are you kind of getting through a day, or are you kind of blocking things? Is is the person queuing, for instance, just blocking? Okay, we're just going to do all the footsteps right now. We're going to do all the body the next day. Now we're going to do, um, yeah, uh, the kind of crazy effects. Yeah, we we do we do generally do um, things in chunks like that with footsteps first, and then um, hand movements. Usually, the very first thing that I do is is I do what's called rustling the film, which is you basically you watch the whole thing silent, and you have some cloth and you rustle every movement that you see on screen. And the the helpful reason that you do it first is because then you actually get to know the movie because oftentimes you haven't even seen the movie, um, and so you sort of get to know all the movements and all the characters and what's generally coming up. Um, so you do that and. Yeah, it, and each each type of foley has a different sort of rate of how many cues you'd get through, and of course it it it, it does vary. Hmm. Uh, I suppose but, they're not they're not telling you right. You've got to do thirty five thousand footsteps today, doesn't it? <laughs> no, they, <laughs> they don't usually give me a number now. Yeah, <laughs> um, and then just kind of skipping forward to kind of uh, your monitoring. 
and things like that are generally uh, documentaries. Are you doing a, a 5.1 with uh, the main premise being that it'll probably be a 2.1 apart from a DVD, or how are you kind of how are you generally mixing these days? Um, it it does depend on the project, but you know whether it's going to have a theatrical release or just go straight to video, but or just be on, or there's also ones that are just on television. Um, but I, I usually make a, a 5.1 and uh, an LTRT, a stereo LTRT at the same time. As I'm going, I can sort of switch back, but at the budgets that I'm usually working at, there's not really time to do an entire separate mix for each, you know, where you're really monitoring both at the same time. Um, so I'm usually just flipping back and forth at, or focusing on one for the most part. And if it's in a theater, you know, it's, it's likely to be able to play in 5.1 and... 5.1 is, is very helpful for a documentary because just because you have the dialogue channel in the center um, and therefore the music, you can have more spread out in the stereo and also have things spread a little bit with effects. Um, but having the dialogue center and separated is really a wonderful thing and it does help a lot. And again, that's your, yeah, the main focus just straight on the center of the screen, just saying right. story, 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 story. So I guess yeah. you can get more dynamic range in your whole in your whole mix as well, and it becomes more fun in that respect. Definitely, definitely. Cool. Yeah. Um, I mean, some more questions are coming in just on general, I mean, career advice, which is always kind of a bit too general. But um, in terms of... Uh, I guess it, it kind of relates to team dynamics because a lot of people are going to, I mean, they'll be doing their own things, but when you want to do uh, like feature film documentary or just even uh, a longer short film, I suppose you're going to have to, if you're going to be efficient, try and, try and work with a lot of other people. Are there any uh, kind of methods that you've uh, kind of developed to be more efficient in terms of just your communication of what's being uh, kind of done at the same time, if you see what I mean, in terms of the project's development. Because I know you're a supervising mm -hmm. sound editor, for instance, and so mm -hmm. uh, your general role is obviously to communicate kind of the director's vision and then, and then delegate that. Right. Uh, how are you keeping a handle on communication and also on uh, keeping kind of a... Uh, a kind of vision for the piece at the same time. Right. I mean, it's it's pretty critical, you know, to to communicate, especially with um, budgets, and you know, you often do not have enough time, and so you really have to communicate because if you have a dialogue editor doing one thing, and or probably more aptly, if you have the the effects and the foley, really need to communicate because you could be saving a lot of time, but if the effects guy can cover it, then, you know, then the Foley guy doesn't have to. Um, so it's it's quite critical to cover all that. Um, and are you doing this through, um, are you doing, like, morning meetings? Are you saying, because usually, um, uh, definitely, it for the feature film guys that I've been talking about, they're getting right. pushed right up until the line for, like, that, the change in picture, and they're kind of having the the phone calls with the picture department, going, "Well, what is changing? We don't really want anything yet, but can you just give us a heads up as to what's probably going to be axed? Is it is it a same, like a similar dynamic in documentary? Um, it definitely. It I mean, everybody's always trying to push up to the end, but it's probably a little bit less so in documentary. Um, that there's so many, it really sort of depends on the project though. There is a lot of pushing the locking of picture to the end, um, for sure. Yeah. Mm. Um, and so I guess people that kind of want to get into it just need to. I suppose you're you're very well. Are you very welcome to people that just want to kind of come on, on work experience and help you with that kind of workload? I mean, I would say the best the best way to get into it. There's, there's sort of two ways. There's the hard scrabble way where you sort of answer um, a lot of those ads. On, at least in New York, one of the ads is mandy.com or 
um, sites like that where there's just people looking for people to work for very little on their films. And it, it's sort of, that's kind of the rougher way to get into it. But, you know, I've seen people do that and actually start to gain a little name for themselves. Um, the other way is to really find a place that's doing something that you're interested in, like documentary, and just become an intern there or, you know, offer, offer your services. And it's, it's not easy, you know. Like, I, as you heard in my story in the beginning, I was pretty blessed, you know, with the situation. And, but working at Gigantic Studios, you know, I've, I've seen two people now who started out as just interns and now have careers, you know. So it does happen. Yeah, I, I mean, just speaking for me, I've personally gone down the, I started out in the, the kind of Mandy forum, uh, right. <laughs> which is kind of like Craigslist, but I mean, oh, they did update yeah. their website, actually. I mean, oh, originally they? it looked like it was from like 1989, the beginning of the right. internet, and there's a few right. dodgy jobs on. But you can get some really good stuff if you're, if you're fast enough. Yeah, Again, that's usually you know, really tricky because obviously you've got to be then unemployed to try and get the best jobs, which is just yeah, a general minefield. Yeah, um, I mean the other thing, the other amazing way to get into it, which you probably can speak to more, is and this is how Tom Paul originally got into post-production sound, is that if you're the boom operator or you're the sound mixer on set, especially with people who haven't been making a lot of films and don't really know a lot, they're going to be you know if they're just going to ask you, like, do you know, do you know anyone who does post-production sound? And you can be like, mm, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and that's what Tom did. I mean, Tom um, originally, I think he worked on some film with Ang Lee as the sound mixer on, on set and, and somehow parlayed it into a, a mixing job. And I, I forget if it was that one or some other one, but that's, that's how he got his start, you know, literally just went from boom operator to post-production uh, supervising sound editor, just that jump. And I think that would be a great way, is if getting into, but but you could probably, I mean, that was a long, he, he, this was when, you know, probably 1998 when he did that or, or, or whereabouts. So I don't know what things are like these days, but. Well, I am, yeah, I am actually doing this, getting into a similar thing, mainly because when I was doing a kind of, film school and things, obviously you get a lot of projects um, in film school because A, no one's doing sound, and B, you don't really want to write a, a dissertation or anything else when you're getting so much work. So, <laughs> so you're kind of going from both sides. But the annoying thing is, is that when you can't, when you're not the person who's also recording, I find it incredibly frustrating fixing other people's problems as opposed to my own, where I can mm -hmm. kind of be like, mm -hmm. Well, I know what I did, and right. okay, I'm gonna have to. I did do my it. best, you know. Right. Yeah, and it it didn't work, but it's it's kind of fine. So, yeah, I'm having yeah, actually, yeah, that is a an interesting way to get in, and especially just I find working on my own stuff. Obviously, the the benefits of uh, of even just speaking to post production, um, obviously have a, a dramatic effect on just recalling what you did on the day and now how it's kind of sounding. Yes. Are, you, are the people that are directing um, also the camera people, also the sound people, and are you uh, giving them feedback in terms of uh, I mean, how things sound, is, or are they, are they just kind of like, can you just fix it and not tell me about it? <laughs> that, that is like one of, one of the biggest disconnects I've seen in, in, in our industry which is the, the, the disconnect between the sound recordist and the post-production. I've almost never talked to a post um, the sound recordist on set. I mean, usually it, it just, at the time, you're just like, well, this is what I've got. What's the point in talking to that guy? And it, it's also, there's no contact with them. You know, they're, they're long gone by that point. You know, they're, they've moved on to 10 more jobs. Um, so, and it, it's, it's also, you know, not not typically the same people. So, you know, maybe maybe it's different in Hollywood when you're at, you know, huge budget films, but um, for those reasons, I've rarely, if ever, talked to... The, the, the only reason I often... The only reason that usually I would call a sound recordist is to find out what mics they're using on set because it's nice to be able to match ADR with the same mic. But other than that, I really... And it is a big disconnect. Um, 
But I would think that the sound recordist might be very interested in hearing what the final take of the mixer or the sound team was on, on his tracks to see what he could do better. But that's definitely a disconnect. Well, I hope to help solve that problem. Yeah, that's what problems. you're here for. You know, I'm, <laughs> and you're here as well, so it's fantastic. Right. So if I was, if, say I'm, I mean, they're generally, yeah, if they don't generally have a sound mixer, I suppose, they're either, for the sit-down interviews, just clipping on a lav, and then generally it's just going to be a, a mic on top of the camera. Is that generally what you're, what you're using, or what you're kind of left with? If it's, um, you know, an amateurish, you know, first-time director, that's often what you have is, is just a lav. But usually they will um, attach a better mic to the camera. They won't just use the built-in. You know, usually yes. they've gotten enough advice from, from people in the community to, to let them know to do that. So, yeah. And, and sometimes there will be a boom operator, depending on the situation, yeah. Again, it's it's size of projects, but it's it's really interesting, I guess, in terms of how uh, affordable things are now in terms of the quality that you can get out. Um, do you think that's a, had a, a really big impact on the on the documentary scene in terms of films that are, are getting kind of picked up and actually put through post production, um, even to the extent of uh, sound, for instance, to get a proper release? Yeah. Um... It, the whole the whole world has changed in that in that respect, and anybody can really make a documentary these days. It still you know it still requires that you, it's it's still maybe I shouldn't say anybody because it does still require a certain budget or at least a trust fund you know to be able to support yourself <laughs> because it's a huge amount of time input. That's really the biggest expense. Um, it's how much time you need to put in, but the equipment itself has come down drastically in price, of course, and so that allows a whole new generation of filmmakers. It's really, yeah, it's really exciting. I suppose on the, on the same hand as well, it's, it's again, just trying to find people that are, are actually getting, getting the, the training for uh, them being able to use all this cheap technology without feeling the kind of just entitlement of being able to buy it with a production manual um, right. makes, makes you uh, an instant uh, professional. Right, um, exactly. In terms of, uh, so re going kind of back to kind of day-to-day -day workflow, in terms of uh, reconforming and things like that, is that slowing down uh, your production workflow a lot, or are you kind of just getting um, a separate editor to just do the reconforming and just provide you with those new cuts of the documentary as you go along? No, that's um, that's usually something that, I or another editor will do ourselves, and usually they're not too crazy. They're just making a few uh, nips and tucks here and there, and conforms can take, you know, half a day to a day. It depends on what part of the process you're in, you know. Um, it's It just sort of feels like part of the job, you know. It just, it just, it does happen, and, and sometimes it happens after the mix is done, you know, where you're sort of conforming the whole mix. To maybe when they were making a sale of the movie, the, the the company that wanted to buy it said, you know, we like it, but we want to change a few things. That often happens too. Yeah. Oh, so you're coming back even after you finish the final mix to then just essentially just re re not redo the mix, but just just right. tweak it in those senses. Yeah, I mean sometimes you're sometimes they're adding stuff though, so in which case you would remix a little bit, but but definitely. Um, cutting things out um, after the thing's completely over. Yeah, happens a lot. And do you find that, because for me it's, uh, well, especially like other other sound designers and things, especially when they're starting out, um, and especially, I suppose, even more so in the documentary range, there's always this sense of the film is, you never really finish a film, you just kind of run out of time. But now yeah. they're kind of, uh, because of the technology again, because it's, uh, kind of, uh, let's say, cheap and cheerful. Are you, right. How do you find, um, just constantly, like, do you find that you're, you have to remix things a lot after a kind of certain point? Are people coming back to you, say, oh, yeah, we got picked up here, and then we got picked up here, and then we got picked up here? Yeah, I mean, um, 
I would say we still you still sort of have to abandon as as they say art is never finished it's it's abandoned you know so you still the budgets just don't allow of course it may be different in big hollywood budgets but they just don't allow you really to have enough time ever <laughs> to do to do the job that you would love to do um for sure but but it does happen as i said they come back you know i have i have a job that's coming back um, next week for an Albert Maisel's documentary called Iris, which is um, about a 90-year-old um, fashion designer. Mm. And so they're, they're, you know, they, they completely finished. They, they already showed at a festival, and they're coming back for some mixed tweaks, you know, to tweak things here and there. So definitely happens. Yeah, more often than not. Yeah, it's yeah. really interesting. I guess, again, people are still... Um, even with all these recent developments in terms of technology and things, I guess people are now, because they can, they are, in a way, just kind of pushing it longer and trying to, again, not abandon it for as long as they possibly can until the, the kind of next one comes along. Exactly. Um, are you finding that's kind of even more prevalent in documentary because they've spent so long, like these people could be spending years on this story. Yeah. Um, do you think it's more, more prevalent than in the kind of narrative stuff that you're doing? I would say it's about equal. It's about okay. equal. Yeah. Right. Maybe, you know, sometimes I've heard many a, many a documentarian who, you know, sometimes they work on it for seven years, you know, five years, seven years, ten years. Um, and sometimes they're just kind of like, I'm, I'm really done with this. You know, like I want it to be <laughs> over as much as they love it. And as, and as amazing as the film usually are, as they usually are, um, they kind of... When you're so again, like have your blinders on with the project, you can you can sort of get a little overwhelmed and just want it to be over. <laughs> yeah. How how are you dealing with kind of just having the the kind of cabin fever <laughs> like blinkers on? How do, uh, how do you kind of are you taking? Is it coming down to sort of just periodic breaks? Are you also working on? several projects at once? Are you just like just really focused and just straight through? What's kind of your work ethic in terms of oh, getting my projects own. Well, out? Yeah. yeah, I mean I was referring to the documentary filmmaker themselves. They they usually want to move on. Mm. But for myself, um, how do I deal with it? Yeah, I mean I find that mixing is the area where I need l the least amount of breaks for some reason. Something about mixing, I really get into like a Zen flow, and I can find like myself like eight hours later, ten hours later, like whoa, what what happened? And then there's something like dialogue editing, which is can be a little bit mind numbing, you know, because it's quite. I mean, there's no there's no job in post production that's more meticulous, more attention to detail, and by most you know assessments, not the most exciting. Um, and so dialogue editing, I, I, I do need to, like, take very periodic breaks and just get up and walk around a little bit, clear my head, and you're, you're, so you're just like this for, for many hours, like, uh, okay, you know, edit this little tick out, and, like, okay, the, the bug, and, like, finding tone, it's quite, a, you know, dialogue editors should be, should be paid, you know, well. <laughs> if they're, yeah. if they're, good. If they're good at what they do. They really, they really earn um, their keep. Um, whereas mixing, mixing is really more like it's almost like playing an instrument. You're really sort of like it's very creative, it's very artistic, and so it's it it requires less of the of of those breaks. Um, so yeah, nice. And in terms of obviously documentaries being played back, um, let's say they're getting like Netflix deals and things like that. Are you are you playing back on laptops and on televisions at the very end? Or are you just kind of just trusting your mix and you prefer to... I mean, I think I personally prefer to hear it in the nice theater rather than then test it on a, on a yeah. Mac. It, I suppose it's like finishing an album and then listening to it in MP3 on your iPod, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Are you, is that the same? Are you got the same feeling with that? I mean, what, what I personally do, it, it often depends on what studio I'm working in. And some, some studios don't have an easy way to monitor through computer speakers or through, you know, tiny tiny speakers, auritones or what have you. Um, but what I do a lot of, you know, mixes for the web. Um, and in that case, I always, even though I have 
monitors in my, my home studio, I'm always listening also through the computer speakers and, and things like that to make sure. So, and if I have, so if I have, if I have an opportunity to listen to things um, for something that's going to be going to Netflix, I do. Um, but I don't always. But as you do these things a lot, you sort of do get to know what things are going to sound like, what's what's going to work, and what's what's going to come through on on those speakers and what's not. Um, hmm. And you, because you're working in different studios, um, many people are going to have their own studio and and try and calibrate it in some way to obviously uh, get used to it. Are you are you working in just the same kind of set of studios that you kind of understand? And what are the kind of differences in those studios? Do you find that, that one maybe has uh, more of a presence than another in some form? Yeah, I mean, th there are quite quite a wide range of differences. Um, and it, it, a lot of it comes down to how well the studio was originally calibrated, how often it's calibrated. Um, and also the size of the room when you're working on something for the theater can be a pretty amazing impact as well, especially in terms of bass, um, you know, so, you know, mixing, mixing something for the theater that has a lot of bass heavy moments in a tiny room is not going to typically work well. And you can really grossly misestimate, uh, underestimate or overestimate um, what's going to happen in a theater. So mm -hmm. it's pretty critical to test, test that kind of thing out in several venues. Um, so you usually take your mix to several different venues afterwards and, and play it just kind of like the, the speakers? Uh, if it's something that I'm doing in my home, if, if I'm doing it in my home studio, then I'll definitely take it to a bigger mix room just to listen to certain key, key moments hmm. where, where I'm relying on bass. Or, you know, it, most projects like that, I want to at least schedule at least the final mix day in a big theater. Yeah. You know, of course, it depends on the budget, but... Um, I would like to do at least that if, if it's you know, and most most um, narrative things that I'm doing I do I do mix in a in a big enough theater, but so I haven't really run run across that problem problem too much. Usually the things that are going to be ending up in a theater um, often have enough budget to do it in a proper mix room, and it's more like a lot of a lot of stuff that I do in my home studio or web mixes and um, for small ad agencies and things like that. Yeah, I'm. I'm conscious that a lot of people, um, including myself, uh, have home studios, mm. and you mentioned um, recalibration, and not just kind of one calibration, but recalibrating studios kind of periodically. I guess. What are you doing for your own home studio to make sure that you're kind of always kind of on point in terms of your levels? What's kind of your equipment and kind of process for just making sure you're still on track? Yeah, basically just. Um use pink noise. I use the blue sky um, pink noise um, to just, and I do have a 5-1 set up, and so you just, you just make sure that each, each speaker is coming through at the proper level for whatever you're working on, and you know, you, you also need to be sure to calibrate your subwoofer if you have one, but that can be, again, more difficult in a small room, which, which this one is, um, so no matter how, how well you do it, it can. It's just not going to translate the same in a big room. Um, and do you have a specific um, a meter that you're using? Or I use the um, Radio Shack. Um, I forget the model number. Is it the I, I forty dollar one. I've heard that one mentioned yeah. a few times. Yeah, people yeah. just have the forty dollar Radio Shack. One. The forty dollar really? Radio Shack one. <laughs> That's what everyone seems to use because there aren't many others that I know of other than I also have one in my iPhone, a little app, which I can't even remember what that one's called either, but that one sort of, um, that one I never use for bass because I, I really doubt that the, the iPhone mic has much of a bass response, <laughs> but um, it, it sort of gets you through in a pinch for just the, the regular speakers because um, it, it seems to work pretty well, actually. It's pretty similar to the Radio Shack. For that. Ooh. And so you're, like, when you're um, obviously kind of measuring the pink noise, are you just measuring it, like, are you just sitting down and just going, like, <laughs> okay, yeah, well, around I, me, it's looking pretty good. <laughs> yeah. Well, actually, I, I usually stand up, actually, for some reason, but 
I just sort of aim it aim it straight and move move the pink noise around to each speaker, and then um, when I'm at the rear speakers, I do point it backwards and. Okay, nice. Like, yeah, it seems pretty simple. Yeah. I've just never, it's always like one of these things that again is never talked about, probably because it is so simple, and yeah. then it becomes the common sense that, that everyone's not quite sure about. So no, yeah. thank you for that. I mean, That's awesome. There, there, are, there are some complexities to it, to what level you want to um, calibrate. Is it 85 dB? You know, and there, there's different theories as to if you're in a smaller room, 85 doesn't sound like 85 in a big room, even though the mm. meter is saying, you know. So it does, the, there are some complexities, and, you know, you can go into volumes on the duck about, about calibrating your room, you know. Um, the, there are some complexities to it. Um, yeah. But I guess as long as you can keep keeping it consistent throughout a whole session, for instance, and, right? Um, and, and also, you know, and also with the, um, nowadays that that there's a lot of um, loudness meters that also helps a lot because it doesn't matter what level you're listening at. If the loudness meter says that the dialogue is at this level, you can get a basic sense of am I in the ballpark? You know, if you're okay. missing television in America, we do negative twenty four LKFS. Right. I think you guys might do 23, um, but ah, so what was the what was the measurement at the end? Sorry, KF L K F S L K F S ah. in in England or in Europe. I think they do L U F S, but this is for um, okay. this is for um, dialogue. Um, sorry, it's 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 the loudness spec for for yeah. television. So it stands for like loudness unit full scale. Is that exactly. Yeah, I do. Okay. Ah, nice. No, I've not heard about that, so I shall yeah. inquire more. Yeah, um, so then, then if you're using that meter, then no matter how poorly calibrated your speakers are, if it says 24, then you know that you're right. And so that does help a lot. It sort of takes takes out that. that yeah, that kind of doubt, I guess, for yeah. Yeah, moving it across. And so the minus is the the minus twenty three. That's meant to be just the average, or that's meant to be. That's that's the average. The average. That's the okay. average. So, I mean, there's there's different specs. Some sometimes they say that you know, it can never go above twenty or below twenty eight, or you know, uh, or sometimes they say the average can never go has a plus or minus one range. So if you have twenty four instead of twenty three, that's okay. So, yeah. but this, it depends what you're mixing for. Yeah. Hey, yeah, awesome. And just in terms of working at home, I mean, I, yeah, working a long time at home can get distracting in terms mm -hmm. of there's things like a bed in the other room, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. especially for really long days or, again, if you're doing the dialogue editing or you're just yeah. you're spending hours just trying to find find the room tone. Again, are you, are you just taking just frequent breaks to just make sure that you can keep the energy going or is there a, a coffee pot that you uh, you love? <laughs> I actually, I actually don't drink coffee. Believe it or not, <laughs> that is probably drink. a very good thing. The old peak and peak and trough, right? Exactly. I, I avoided that altogether. I, you know, <laughs> have some green tea once in a while, but that's about it. Um, breaks, breaks are essential. I don't, I don't mind working at home. In fact, I love it. I love working at home because you can really set your own schedule. Yeah. That's right. um, I've always just been someone who loves working at home. You know, but I do understand <laughs> the pitfalls of it, um, and I also love working out too. It, it, you know, working outside of my home too. They're, they're, I love having variety. That's probably yeah. the, the spice of life, as they say. You know, it's yeah. it's nice to be able to sometimes work at home, and then sometimes you work in the studio. And this is, yeah, the control of the schedule. That's good. So, how are you yeah. generally? I mean, are you doing any projects alone? What's the kind of minimum crew that you're working with? Yeah, no, I do a lot of projects alone. Um, so that okay. would be the minimum. That would be the minimum. I don't think I've never worked on one with less than me. So. <laughs> well, that's very. So. That's very good. Uh, but some, uh, someday uh, there'll be some plugin that probably will do it for me. So. Yeah, the um, the auto mix RX exactly. RX twenty five or something. Right. <laughs> Sound designer plugin. Um, no, so really. So how are you? Lot. How are you managing your time there? Are you just saying, okay, I'm gonna? It's gonna be. Are you like setting a deadline with the? Um, with the director, or because when it's your own project, a lot of people are, are going to kind of uh, obviously because it's all their own work, they're going to kind of want more time to invest on a project. And so, when it comes to kind of negotiating time and negotiating 
a kind of deadline. How much is imposed on you? As in, sometimes I get things like, yeah, um, we're giving you this now, but we need it for Berlin in mm -hmm. X amount of time. Um, yeah. And how much is kind of, well, we'll just call it whatever amount, and we'll just keep working on it until we're kind of until we yeah. yeah. I mean, I really get both of those situations. Um, it's usually the feature films that are more about, you know, a deadline where it's like we have to get it into Sundance by this date and we should have given you this a month ago but <laughs> this is how much time we have yeah. and so you're just sort of scrambling and of course they have to understand that you know that you can only do as much as you can in that amount of time but usually usually you you know you, you can you can do a lot to a film even in a short amount of time you can bring it to a new level even if you didn't go as far as you you know would would have loved to um, it really, it really is worth it, you know. So. Um, and so, are you generally just picking? Are you saying, okay, well, I'm, I'm only going to work on dialogues now, and it's going to just be a week of dialogues, and then I'll kind of, I'll nail the dialogues to, a, to pretty much a, a good premix level, and mm -hmm. then I'll start on the effects. Or are you kind of breaking it down scene by scene and just saying, I'm going to just make this scene really good, and then I'll just right. go into the next scene. And how how is that kind of divided up? Well, when I'm working on uh, when I'm working on a full film, then I'm usually not working alone. So what I was referring to more is I do a lot of shorts or or just like um, three or four minute ads um, or three or four minute whatever things for the web. So I do a lot of that kind of stuff. Or I work at in demand, which is um, the channel in America where it's the where you get on demand. Movies and I'm so I'm mixing promos for them, which are 30 second promos. Um, so there, you know, it's it's there. I'm doing everything mm. on these shorter things. But once it's on a longer thing, you know, I have done the entire thing myself before. But typically, there's at least one other editor doing something. Mm. That's pretty um, good. But are yeah. you generally are you generally just doing the scene by scene thing, or are you kind of just doing the kind of full pass of one particular aspect? Because I know that's the case when you're in a bigger team, because it, it just makes sense for efficiency-wise. But are you continuing that that practice when you're on your own, or are you kind of dabbling in between things as you, for instance, see a, a slight problem in the dialogue, then you'll start working on an effect to make sure that that can, right. can kind of work. It's a, it's an interesting question because there's a, there's a film I supervised last year called The American Side, where I was the supervisor, but I was also the dialogue editor, but I was also the mixer. I mean, well, actually, maybe I was the effects, yeah, I did effects on that one. Right, I was the supervisor, the effects editor, and the mixer, and so I could sort of sneak ahead and do some mixing while I was doing effects, but it, it kind of gets a little tricky because, number one, the client isn't paying you to mix it. They're paying at that point because it's all budgeted out, you know, they're paying you to do the effects, so you want to make sure you use the time for effects effectively to do <laughs> effects <laughs> and use the mixing time to do mixing. So, you know, for that reason, it, and, and also just to give the effects the attention they deserve. So um, I think it is important to, to compartmentalize yourself and focus, stay focused in that way. So I guess, again, it's, it's all about if you're taking breaks as well, maybe you'll just come back or just decide to just put something down if it's if it's been frustrating you for a while and then just come back to it later. Definitely, definitely. If there, you know, like sometimes it just can't get the sound design right here. It's just not working. Put it down. Either go do something else or just there's usually plenty of other things for you to do in that same film. And so you can just move on to something else and come back to it. Definitely. Cool, cool. And Pro Tools, Pro Tools is the only system that you're kind of using. You're not using any other editing software so maybe it's it's certain uh, presentation or it's certain effects that it only has, or are you just using Pro Tools? No, I'm just using Pro Tools and have for many years. Um, I use SoundMiner as well for to um, uh, call up effects from my library. Ah, but okay, SoundMiner. That's just a plugin that goes into Pro Tools, or is it standalone? It's actually a stand. It's actually a standalone um, piece of software. It's basically just like a database. It's a way of organizing and pulling, and it's specifically made for Pro Tools, but also other DAWs. Um, to, and so you just 
it allows you to sort of have a big list. You can type in searches for, you know, I want gunshots, um, and then you can sort of go through each one and see what they sound like, and you can take pieces of it. You can actually has a wonderful um, pitch modulator in it built mm -hmm. in that you can slow sounds down, which is amazing for sound design. Use it all the time when you, you know, you can take something... Uh, I'm trying to think like something like rain or, you know, crickets chirping or whatever it is, slow it down and all of a sudden it becomes a crazy sounding spooky <laughs> sound design. And so you can use SoundMiner for that reason and then pull it right into Pro Tools and there you go. And are you, are you going out and recording any of your own effects? A lot of people in post-production are obviously just collecting things as they go along. Um, yeah. Probably from your, your Foley definitely as well. But in terms of sound right. effects, how, how much would you say is kind of just library bought and how much is kind of just your own? Um, it's definitely both. I mean, the library that I have, um, which originally came through Tom Paul, has, you know, over, you know, I think 120,000 effects in it. But I've definitely added, as we've done each film, you know, we often go out in the field and record the sounds of crowds or just, you know, a lot of films take place in New York City. Maybe they take one take, um, we did one film that took place in Chinatown, so we would get sort of specific recordings there. And another one called Holy Rollers, which took place in Brooklyn in Hasidic neighborhoods. Um, so we went there to record the sounds there. Um, I worked on a film called uh, New York Street Games, which was a documentary about street games of kids growing up in the 40s and 50s, you know, back when New York was filled, the streets were just filled with kids all the time playing after school and all the different games they played. So I, I would, you know, I actually used to be a school teacher. I didn't go into that, that half of my life. But so I went back to my old school and recorded all the kids playing. And so just would, and all this stuff I, I, I put into my, uh, my library because there's always some point where you have kids playing, you're like, oh, let me go to that one. Yeah, definitely. And baby's crying. That is always, crying. yeah, that is the calling card, the ace. <laughs> yes. And I had a baby, not not personally, but um, my wife and I had a baby. <laughs> oh, that's and so, good. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I definitely recorded her a lot, you know, to get some good sounds, some giggles, some cries, some whatever. <laughs> Fantastic, fantastic. I have a nice palette there, too. <laughs> and in terms of just uh, naming those, because, again, a lot of mm. people are, is it, it's all just tags? Are you having a certain system where it's, because there's a million ways you can go with kind of kids laughing, um, but obviously you're only searching so many things. So I guess are you kind yeah. of just doing it in broad categories and then anything that sticks out, such as, um, I guess, Yelp? I don't know. Anything mm. that sticks out, are you just adding that in as another tag? Yeah, you really have to get create. You have to get creative with that because it can be so. You, you can't really necessarily think in terms of what it actually is. You have to think in terms of what could it be used for. That's really important because otherwise you're just never gonna. You know, there could be gold buried in your library, and I'm sure there is plenty of things that were not when they originally made were not named well, mm. and so, you know, so... Are you ever going back and, and renaming stuff as you go along? Or definitely, you definitely. Yeah. I always, when I find something that I really like and I, and, and I wouldn't have found it, you know, maybe I happen upon it, you know, or I get lucky and I find it, I'm like, oh, you know, I definitely add things right then. You have to do that. And, and sometimes you give things names like... Um, um, you, you you type in the initials of the film that it came from because sometimes you just remember wasn't that film didn't it come from that film let me try typing those initials um, and sometimes you want to add things like sometimes I do things like just good or no or I don't even forget what <laughs> word I use I think it might have been good or just like and then you can just type that in and you get all the list of the sounds that you really sort of are often using. Ah, okay, okay. Not just all yeah. the good sounds. <laughs> right. <laughs> Which would be a whole library in A to Z or something. Exactly. Fantastic. So, okay. Cool. 
Yeah. Well, I'm just kind of waiting for clarification on one more question, and then oh, really? that'll, that'll kind of be it. Yeah, it's on drama features. Do you prefer big, shiny Hollywood sound or more uh, European, raw, simpler sound? I suppose that's an, uh, an argument in itself as, as in if they both actually do that. But generally, I suppose Hollywood, bigger, better, larger, UK fiction kind of raw in a sense, I don't know, more natural. I don't know if you have any thoughts on that. So wait, so just repeat the, the two choices again? So it was just, do you prefer kind of, I guess, big, uh, shiny Hollywood sound, as in just very right. sterile, everything's there, um, mm. or uh, more European, raw, simpler sound? Mm. I think there could be an argument for both cases. I, get, I guess it, it comes down to the kind of effect recording the there. Film. That he used. Yeah. Um, I kind of like the the European version in European films, you know, and I love the Hollywood one in Hollywood <laughs> films because they are they are both they both definitely have their place. They def both definitely have their place, and you know, yeah. Well, I suppose. Uh, well, why don't you just uh, pick a recent movie from this year that you've seen that's had just really impressive sound too. Well, you know, when you do have a baby, one thing that you may not know, because I, I don't think you have a baby, do you? No. <laughs> no. So um, you don't get to come out to movies very much. Okay. So, so I, I'm trying to think if there's even anything I, I actually went out to see this year. And I think there was something, but I can't remember what it was. Um, very, very rarely these days do I actually get to go see movies, um, but, you know, one, one, one movie that always comes to mind when I think of great sound is um, Requiem for a Dream, uh, which yeah. is amazing, crisp um, Hollywood style, I guess you, you would call it, um, sound, sound design, and just amazing. So that, that, that's always one that I like to go back to. Nice. And, uh, yeah. But it has uh, its place, you know. It has its place, and the, there's. I'm also a big fan, as I was saying, on documentaries or on more realistic films, where you just you need to make it feel real. That's. I hate when I can. If you if you know that it's a sound effect, you've done something wrong. You know, you want it to feel like it's it's actually happened. Yeah, I think I think that's a just a really good conclusion. Uh, to our talk, really. So I just I just want to thank, firstly, all the people that have uh, been frantically commenting and saying yay and ooh and ah and yes, all <laughs> the all the drama that's been going on, which is fantastic. Um, awesome. And if, yeah, and if they haven't subscribed or anything, or you're watching this now and thinking this talk is awesome because it is, um, then you can subscribe, you can like, um, and yeah, get in, get involved with some more chats. I'll be definitely having you back, Eric, in terms of trying to get some more um, specific things kind of covered that people are kind of asking for. But I just sure. want to thank you for your time. And I don't know if you've got any kind of final thoughts for everyone um, that you kind of want to impart. I mean, we have covered a lot in this session, which is We certainly fantastic. have. We certainly have. Yeah. Um, nothing comes to mind. Well. <laughs> I just want to thank you. That kind of sums it up. <laughs> okay. So thank you very much, everyone, for getting involved. And I appear to have lost Eric. I don't know where Eric's gone. He'll probably reappear in a, in a second or two, I hope, to say goodbye. Um, but every, everyone on the comments, how did you enjoy it all? And I'll wait for Eric to get back. Mm. All right. Where has Eric gone? I don't know where Eric has gone. I hope he comes back soon using the link. Ta -da. Oh, come on, Eric. Let's get back. Maybe I shouldn't have pressed that bell. It probably alarmed him. Okay, he's back. 
<laughs> did you get scared? You got scared by the, the, the chair. I'm not the sure what happened.